So here's a, a system, really interesting system that does um, outsourcing of, uh, uh, it optimizes procurement supply and demand by improving the expressiveness, the efficiency, and the granularity of the supply and demand auction. Uh, and it uses constraints and tree searches to do that. A guy named Thomas Sandholm was the key guy behind this. And um, at, at the time that they documented this for AAAI, they had hosted 230 procurement events for a total of $16 billion, a cost savings, documented cost savings of $1.8 billion. Now you see we're moving from the M's to the B's. That's a big deal. This was the first time I saw the B's showing up at the AI conferences. Uh, an on-demand web-based um, product. Uh, it ran on a 64-bit shared server farm. They now have uh, bigger clusters that they're running it on. This is a really beautiful system. Um, John Laird, uh, who is uh, one of the key architects of the uh, SOAR architecture, which is sort of a deep problem-solving architecture in AI, uh, gave a talk about a decade ago at an AI conference and said that games are the killer app for AI. Well, now it's obvious. At the time that he said it, there was very, very, very weak AI in any games. And now, uh, in Halo 3, you get very sophisticated AI. The, the opponent uh, forces are, um, are remarkably agile. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so AI has been evolving in the competitive game industry. Uh, this is a big industry, another industry with Bs around it. Uh, 29 billion uh, US dollars versus the movie industry, 27 billion. I think the disparity is even more uh, than that now. Um, and of course, you can also get AI in VR environments with the avatars and characters uh, simulating various kinds of uh, Turing test applications. Uh, you could also imagine educational applications where the Sphinx might uh, give you a history of its land uh, and you could talk to it and, uh, and it could answer questions for you. So you can imagine traversing these 3D landscapes uh, that have all kinds of interesting artifacts that were educational and could really enhance your experience. Yes? Is there work being done on expert systems that actually can evaluate the quality of the information they consider? Yeah, great question. So the answer to that is yes and yes. So it's expert systems that can evaluate the quality of new information that they incorporate, and they can evaluate the quality in really mechanistic ways. For example, they can look at page rank, they can look at the reputation of the source, they can see whether a particular source is peer reviewed or not. Um, so, and they can even see how many articles a particular person has in a peer reviewed journal. So you could score the quality of data from a particular source. Uh, so that's inside the context of a, uh, an expert system or a knowledge system. But there are a variety of search engines that attempt to do that. Google is one who does it in a, in a kind of weak way with PageRank. Uh, and PageRank, of course, just gives you links. It doesn't give you the, the answer. But there are, there's true knowledge uh, that tries to give you a deeper view into uh, the information that it's presenting to you. You could look that up. There, there's also uh, Wolfram Alpha that attempts to do something like that where they actually adjudicate the knowledge. They have a, a, a team of 200 plus people that actually are looking at the knowledge and sifting through knowledge and attempting to curate knowledge and make that available. So that's a different thing than a purpose-built expert system that's a large bodies of knowledge. You know, imagine the CRC uh, Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. If you remember that, it's a big um, book that physicists use. And uh, if you are in organic chemistry classes, it's very good for that. And, uh, and that book is available now online in various forms. And you can imagine curating. That, that certainly has been curated. You can imagine other things like that. And what Wolfram Alpha is attempting to do is to build a huge body of curated information. So that's another way to get at this. Other questions? Jeff. 
Uh, yeah, speaking of Wolfram Alpha, um, Mathematica has a language that has been used for developing artificial applications, and it's pretty elegant. It's yeah. slick, it's quick, it's fast. Yeah. Very few lines do amazing things. Yes. Are there other platforms that are really effective in coding AI applications? Like, as far as obviously C++ and Lisp are great, but yeah. that was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Lisp uh, has enjoyed a renaissance recently uh, because at the time that, it, that McCarthy built it, uh, it ran very inefficiently. So if you had a Lisp system, you often had to recode it in C++ in order to uh, have it run with any reasonable performance on a real-world application. But now, thanks to exponential acceleration, um, people can write their applications in Lisp and have them run directly and even compile them, and they're incredibly fast. Numenta is using Python, uh, and that's a pretty good language. And the best uh, way to think about these things is to think about using componentry. So getting a vision pattern recognition system and hooking that into a uh, optimization system that perhaps is built in Mathematica. So the idea is to program with large parts as opposed to programming in any particular language where you're still building things from scratch. The issue is less which language are you using and more how much leveraged knowledge are you incorporating? Um, what you're really saying is how knowledgeable an AI system is is not a function of how complex the algorithms are. It's a function of how big the data set, the trained it is. No, you, you said that, and I partially agree with that. Um, I, what I'm saying is that the, the issue is not just about the size of the data set and not even about uh, the amount of knowledge. It's that you were asking what's the best language to code these things in. And I was saying that, that there's a strategy that goes a meta level beyond language. Because I think that at some level, there are, these languages are Turing equivalent. They, you will always have to specify your intent in them. And uh, whether you use Python or Lisp or Java or some other uh, AI language, you end up having to do a lot of coding. So the, the strategy that gets you the, the farthest the fastest is to pick larger components and to build at a higher logical level so that you imagine building with circuit uh, blocks. That, that's the way circuits are built now in the integrated circuit world. People will plunk down large sets of functionality and, and instead of uh, designing every transistor every time they build a new chip, right? Um, Dan. I think this is a really important point. It's, it's absolutely true in AI, but it's also absolutely true in robotics. That yes. uh, over and over again, you see uh, people start to develop a system from the, from the ground up, and they reproduce all the work that all these people have done before them. So uh, you know, you, if you're gonna build a robot base, right, or you're gonna build a, a vision system or whatever, don't, don't go build your own, right? Go find the ones that are out there. And I think one of the really key things that are going on right now is standardization. People are starting to say, let's not do this anymore. Let's have an operating system that everybody can use to build AI, and we'll put all our blocks on it, and they'll all actually work together, oh my god. And uh, Will Garage down the street, you referred to a few times, they're trying to build hardware that everybody can, can get into at a certain level, so you don't have to build another robot base. And if we can start to do that, it's really going to push the pace. Absolutely. Yes? Is there any sort of um, knowledge capturing system in AI that's unified? So like anyone in the world could plug into it and see what level um, they can build on from that system. Again, yeah. it's the knowledge capturing thing. Right, so um, another way to frame that question is, has anyone attempted to capture all the world's knowledge? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, well, let's see, there, there are two answers to that. One is uh, Doug Lennett at Sitecorp has done the most work over the longest period of time. This is a guy who started over 20 years ago building the world's largest knowledge base. And he's still at it. And he has uh, a huge number of uh, AI algorithms for different classes of problem solving in it including micro-worlds and all kinds of, you know, truth-proving, all kinds of really sophisticated algorithms, and a huge amount of 
codified knowledge. He hired philosophers uh, to build ontologies so that they can incorporate knowledge using a standard ontology. But uh, Doug has found that it's a little bit like boiling the ocean. You know, it is a huge project and it goes on and on. I think that uh, he has some traction there. I mean, he's a friend and I think that he's, he's done great work uh, and uh, I have a huge amount of respect for it. I'm not sure that I would always start with psych if I was going to go after some particular problem because it's carrying a lot of mechanism uh, that where you probably won't use 90% of it to solve any particular problem. So if you have an organization where you want to bring AI problem solving to the table, you wouldn't ordinarily uh, want to bring everything to the table and then have to train people to sift through all the mechanisms and decide what they're going to use and what they're not going to use. It takes a fair amount of sophistication to use that system. The, the other answer is the web incorporates at some level, you know, sort of the closest approximation to incorporating all the world's knowledge. Uh, but there's the dark web as well as uh, the open web. The dark web refers to lots of knowledge bases behind firewalls and in private places, proprietary places. So there's a dark web and an, an open web. And at some level, sort of that combination captures a huge amount of the world's knowledge. I don't know of a system that can easily interpret the semantics of that information. That is a very big deal. We don't have systems that have deep enough natural language understanding that they can just go out to any uh, article on the web and truly uh, interpret them in a deep way. They can do latent semantic indexing. They can do lots of different uh, text uh, analysis of the documents. But will they gain a really deep and synthetic understanding of how these things relate to each other? Probably not yet. O other questions? Yeah. I think you uh, partly answered my question just then. But um, I work for the tourism industry, and I'm very much uh, interested in enabling the tourism industry for moving into the semantic web and yeah. enabling agents. Yeah. Um, it's not a lost cause. It's, I just wanted to verify with you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to move the industry into this, and then I'm trying to explain the, what are the, what are the merits in actually moving to ontologies and RDF mm -hmm. and, and and plugging the semantic web. Uh, uh, what are some uh, good uh, success stories? Or are there any success stories yet about uh, the value of moving into um, this paradigm of, of, of having, like, in moving into the semantic web? Yeah, I, I think if you look at um, CommerceNet, the CommerceNet site that Marty Tenenbaum uh, put together, there are lots of examples uh, there. In fact, um, I asked Marty to give a talk at an AI conference, and he gave a talk called um, uh, AI meets Web 2.0, and it's available. I, I can make it available. You're going to be here for a couple days, so I can just give you a link to it. Uh, and it has a lot of examples of the significance not only of ontologies, but also folksonomies, which are informal ontologies. The, uh, we've built a lot of formal ontologies. One of them is uh, undergoing a vetting process by the IEEE standards or organization. But the, but the problem is that it requires a lot of sophistication on the part of the people who use it. And what, and at some level, what you want uh, are folksonomies uh, that, that give you some standardization and some flexibility, some informality. So I would say, I would start with Marty's paper. That would be a great place to start. Yeah. I have a question uh, relating the learning curve of people and how can they learn to program these technologies, for example. Uh, for example, I recently um, uh, I, I was uh, learned about uh, MIT Open Courseware, yes. where you can access you know free uh, lectures from MIT, yes, free, yes, all the world. Is there any portal or any website where you can do this type of things with uh, AI programming so more people can get involved into it? Yeah, that probably the best current portal is Triple AI, and uh, there's some links in this talk, and I can also give you other links, uh, to AI topics 
uh, AI Topics is a service that the AAAI, which is sort of the organization of record in AI, uh, has. And then you can go from AI Topics into lots and lots of different uh, pathways, depending on what your interests are, whether it's genetic algorithms or neural networks or HTMs or, you know, you can go just about anywhere from there. Does AAAI or another organization have something like a mind map or something similar to that of who is doing what and where in AI? Uh, they have a, a wiki uh, in the AI topics arena, uh, but it isn't a crisp who's doing what where. It's sort of an um, article-based uh, thing. Uh, we have, in your notebooks, uh, Dan and I have put together uh, a, a short list of who's uh, doing various things in AI and robotics, who the sort of key researchers are. And at some other time, we could sit down over lunch or something and we can go over, you know, what are these people working on and that kind of thing. But I think that rather than uh, looking at a, a big database of, you know, the, the 5,000 people and what they're doing, it's useful to know a few that are reference uh, points that are sort of the stars in certain areas. Yeah, other questions? Or I'll go on. Okay. Um, so it's an interesting observation that expertise obviates the need for search, and search reduces the need for expertise. Let me instantiate that for you. Um, if you want to find out something, you can go to your local library, which may be the web, or you could actually go to the Stanford Library or whatever your lo local library is, and you can just dig around and try to find the answer. And you might get conflicting answers. Probably we'll get conflicting answers if it's a complex question. Uh, or you can go down the hall, and uh, if you happen to have high quality experts down the hall, and ask them what they think. And chances are the answer that you will get back will be synthetic, will be filtered, will be appropriate for the granularity and the context that you're asking in. So that's an example of expertise obviating the need for search. And if you don't have access to an expert, doing a web search is not a bad idea because it's, you know, as everyone here knows, it, you can find out a lot of things really quickly with a web search. You don't always get answers. Sometimes you just get links to articles. One of the nice things about Wolfram Alpha and True Knowledge is that they actually try to provide answers as opposed to just links. Um, and uh, the item on the bottom, Siri, is a web-based task agent uh, that evolved from the DARPA, Kalo, and PAL projects, uh, uh, personalized agent-oriented projects. And this is now available, at least on the iPhones. Um, I'm not sure whether they've launched it completely, uh, but we have ways of getting access uh, to it if you want to see a, a demo. Uh, and um, it is a system that implements a personalized agent uh, on an iPhone. And uh, they are very credible people. It does, the agents do limited things, uh, but they are really useful and they are growing in their repertoire of the tasks that they can perform. So one of the things that's useful, if you're thinking about schemas for hanging your knowledge on, about these applications. So one of the axes has to do with what we talked about, the cultural and business processes. The knowledge engineering part is what I thought it was all about when I first got started in this. I thought it was entirely about that axis. The hell with the other things. And it turned out that what we thought was an exercise best left for, you know, we thought of it as sort of plumbing, system in engineering, turns out that like, integrating these applications in a really deep way in the systems that are the legacy systems of whatever organization you're in, that turns out to be the heavy lifting. The AI part, at least from my point of view, is the interesting stuff. But the systems engineering is where you either make it work or you don't, and then there's also that little problem of culture that we talked about. So let's talk about what didn't work uh, in the first 25 years of uh, delivering AI applications. Focusing on AI tool features 
versus the power of knowledge. This gets to what Jeff was talking about earlier. Um, uh, general versus domain uh, task-specific solutions. In particular, general solutions are not that useful, it turns out, for solving any particular problem. Uh, general solutions are good for mathematics, uh, but uh, for the most part, if you really want to solve a problem, you're going to have to nail that problem and build a problem solver that is either domain and or task specific until we have artificial general intelligence and then you won't have that problem. But until we, we do that, you've got that problem and you have to deal with it. So uh, also high maintenance costs if the knowledge changes. So one of the things that you can do, a la your question before about the, uh, w what do we do about um, the knowledge cultures that, that we're in, well, one of the things that you can do is choose your problem wisely. So if the knowledge changes rapidly and you're building a system that's based on the knowledge, pick another problem. So you want a, a problem that has the data changing rapidly, but not the underlying core knowledge that evaluates the data. Is that distinction clear? Everyone? Any questions about that? All right. And then uh, the, another thing that was very difficult was reusing knowledge across time and institutions. Let's talk about that for a minute. How many of you have uh, multiple generations of PCs uh, at home? Yeah? And how many of you have things you care about on some of the older PCs? Uh -huh. And how many of you can run your old applications on the new notebook that you have? It's a hit or miss deal, mostly miss, uh, depending on what we're talking about. And, th and the problem here is that uh, if you build a system with special purpose hardware and very tweaky software that's not standardized, you are going to have a problem. Uh, it's just guaranteed. And it won't be a little problem. It'll be a, a we, like an organization the size of GM, for example, might decide that they're not going to migrate uh, a system that's built on a particular piece of hardware to the next generation uh, system. They may just keep it on an old, running on an older machine. And then they may ask you to maintain it on that older machine. And then you may have to find people that know how that particular operating system works, even though we're n generations behind, you know, after that. So it's a, it's a big deal. Um, let me just pick one or two other things. Um, we talked about most of these things. I think the, uh, the limited learning capabilities is a really big thing. If you can build some learning capabilities into your system, that's a big plus. If it doesn't learn at all and you have to gift it with everything it does, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult and you're going to have to find a way to have people do what the system really should be doing. So what worked? Capturing stable problem-solving knowledge, search, and systems that utilize domain and task knowledge, solving the customer's pain points, combining AI with statistics, optimization, and simulation. We talked about some of those applications. Utilizing standard application infrastructure, rapid high-volume signal-to-symbol transformations. What that's about is being able to take a data stream that's in the form of signals from sensors and rapidly transform that sensor data stream into knowledge. It's quite a trick. Combining massive data with a little bit of knowledge. Again, this is, uh, goes back to the dialogue we were having with Jeff before. He was saying uh, how important it is to have massive data sets. And in fact, that's right. And there's a, another related point, which is if you can have a little bit of knowledge and a lot of data, and the knowledge is about how to process that data, that's a winning combination. Uh, Peter Norvig and his colleagues at Google uh, published an article, I believe earlier this year, called On the Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. It's a beautiful article, uh, and it's all about um, how important it is to have a little bit of knowledge leveraging a lot of data. It helps to disambiguate search, among other things. So finding uh, champions and top management commitment, all those sort of standard things 
for software projects. Really important. Some rules for electrifying knowledge work. I'm not going to go over all of these. Let me just pick one or two. Uh, if you really want to roll up your sleeves and work with people in your organizations and build systems like this, these are the things that you would do. Um, and I would say that the, the most important things that we've talked about um, really have to do with nine. Uh, building incrementally from robust components. That's, that's the whole thing about leveraging big systems. That's where the huge leverage is today over where we were 20 years ago. Um, the uh, point 10 about developing agents that learn and improve continuously, also very big deal. If you can get your system to self-improve continuously, huge, huge benefits. Hard to do. But, but if you can get on that learning curve, that is really great. Um, and the last point about deploying responsibly and considering the consequences, long before we get to artificial general intelligence, we will see some serious problems associated with deployed AI. Uh, you recently probably saw that there was an Asilomar conference where various uh, AI researchers, Eric Horvath and others um, from AAAI, got together and talked about potential consequences of AI. Um, and I think that that is a, an attempt, an early attempt, to try to get a handle on this and do something about it before the toothpaste is out of the tube. Uh, and the issues here, just to be clear about this, the issues are, can be framed uh, that if you have a system that has responsibilities in the real world, if it's doing air traffic control, if it's doing um, surgery or participating in surgery, if it is doing anything that has uh, life-altering consequences, if it's embedded in military equipment, you really need to make sure that you have thought through redundant systems for handling downside consequences. The redundant systems are critically important. You need layers and layers of checks and balances. So I think it's doable. I think that you can control these consequences. For the most part, there will probably be problems. Undoubtedly, th there'll be problems. But there are problems with people as well. So we're, we're not going to get it perfect, but it certainly helps to think about it in advance. So when? So then, as we've discussed, the narrow AI applications are already valuable and ubiquitous. But it's important to note that clarity of vision is not proximity to goal. And it is very easy to confuse those things. Uh, AI researchers got burned repeatedly in their early days. Uh, there's a story about uh, in the 1950s, uh, Newell and Simon and others thought that we would have AIs uh, winning the world chess champion uh, in the 60s, uh, championship in, in the 60s, and it turned out that it took a little longer. They were right about the trends, uh, but uh, they got the timing a little wrong. And the danger now, I think, for AI researchers is that they make, may get the timing wrong in the opposite direction, that they've been burned so many times about timing. They've been too optimistic that given the nature of accelerating exponentials, they may be too conservative now. Uh, and that's, that's a bias that we need to think about. Uh, are any of you familiar with the lily pad problem around exponentials? So imagine that you have a lake that's 25 kilometers in diameter. And you have a tiny lily in the middle of the lake. It's the size of a quarter. And say, it, say it's uh, two centimeters in diameter. And every day, the lily doubles in size until on the 30th day, it covers the entire 25-kilometer lake. So on what day is it halfway across? Anyone want to? Calculate that? Yeah, the 29th day. So that is a very big deal. The 29th day, it's just halfway across. 
So put that into your problem solving toolkits. Uh, predicting the future for a specific date is mostly for fortune tellers. Responsible, and I mean a specific day, like July 14th. But uh, that doesn't refer to trends. Responsible futurists think of data-driven trends, like, like Ray talked about last night. Multiple scenarios, bias, the potential for bias, and probability. Um, so it's very important to have a nuanced approach to thinking about the future, and our task Something that uh, Dan and I worked on very hard this summer was to get the participants in the program to think about skating to where the puck will be. To, to think about where is the, this S-curve, where is it going to be in four years, three years, five years, ten years, uh, depending on what your planning horizon is. That is a very difficult task. Uh, it requires a lot of domain knowledge, a lot of task knowledge, and it's an uncertain task. And that's why you have to make, you have to build in some resiliency so that if you get it a little wrong, which you probably will, you're not screwed. So you want to make sure that you've got some resilience built into your forecasting. Looked at from a biological point of view, it took about 600 million years to go from little single-celled organisms to uh, humans. And, and even longer th than that, depending on the complexity of the organisms we're talking about. And by that standard, I think we're, we're on a great time frame right now. We're doing wonderfully. You know, we are really in the groove for delivering on time. Very important to keep a sense of perspective about that. So let's talk about some projected breakthroughs in AI. Um, high resolution circuit diagrams of all brain areas. Hierarchical temporal memories trained to predict and recognize patterns that people miss. Two or more blockbuster AI application companies after Google based on increasing computing power and new capabilities, smart avatars and virtual worlds. Now, one could argue this has already happened because there are people in, smart, in Second Life that encounter an avatar there that's a you know, chatterbot and they think it's a human being. But we're not talking about those kind of people. We're talking about discerning people. Uh, but it is increasingly hard to tell AI uh, from humans uh, in, in virtual environments. Uh, particularly, th there's a problem that goes the other way. Some of the people that are in these environments, you know, you have to tap them to make sure that they're breathing, you know, that they're really alive. So, so it, it does, the distinction blurs from time to time. I think we can also expect to see a human backlash. Neo-Luddites saying that uh, they're blaming social problems, economic problems on AI and robotics. And AI assistance in routine use, you see a little bit of that with the Siri application that we discussed. But it's not yet a must-have item, and it will be. Uh, major progress in the uh, ongoing step over the line game between AI and human capabilities. So a Go champion, award-winning SAT scores, and social networking uh, popularity. All of these are real challenges right now. Um, AI AI's mandated as must-have components in a board. Uh, so an AI that's completely fearless and can challenge uh, board members. One of the problems that we have now with boards is that uh, boards tend to be selected so that they're cooperative with management. One could imagine a mandated AI that asks all the embarrassing questions and really uh, makes uh, a, a big problem from the point of view of accountability and all that. I think that would be refreshing. Yes, yes, yes. Right, well, you we heard from management on that. Um, so AIs pass the, uh, the formal Turing test, demonstrate the ability to learn advanced concepts in math and science, exceed humans without coaching on standard uh, AI tests and others. And then, uh, AIs demonstrate empathy, emotional intelligence, and social grace in dealing with humans. That's the real challenging one. Yes, Peter. Um, when, when I look at those, those last four, um, they all seem to me, you know, like really pet problems in a sense yeah. that, you know, once you have someone who is, you know, 
50% as good as the best Go player, you know, it just takes one more iteration to be as good and then another to be twice as good and another couple to be like, you know, 100 times good. Mm -hmm. So I in a sense, you know, for example, point eight must have an AI on board doesn't make any sense because once they are about as good as any board member, literally days or maybe months later, they're going to be so much better than any humanly thinkable yeah, board I don't member. I don't think that that's the case. I, I understand your point. But le let me tell you that there is sort of a graduated point here, and that's that one can imagine um, knowledge systems today being a huge asset to a board. Because if they know a certain class, I mean, I've dealt with this directly recently. Uh, if they have a certain set of questions uh, that they can ask all the time, let me just give you some example questions. Uh, there's a, um, a phenomenon that used to be called groupthink about people you know, sort of reinforcing each other's assumptions. And it turns out that you can ask a pretty simple set of questions to get out of it. You can ask questions like, uh, what other alternatives exist to this course of action? Have we considered them? What are their consequences? Uh, what happens if this plan goes wrong? Like Bay of Pigs, for example. So uh, there's a guy named Stanley Finkelstein at the Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth who has been looking at uh, the problems associated with um, groups making decisions that are flawed in various ways. And it turns out that a simple set of questions asked fearlessly could really help. So I think that long before we have um, artificial general intelligence, we'll be able to have systems that participate in decision making and ask those kinds of questions. But I, I understand your point about the um, acceleration factor and the doubling factor. And that will also be true at some point. So I think they coexist. Other questions? Yeah, Celine. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated with this whole area of emotional intelligence and intuition. Uh, has there been any progress in that area? And do you project a time when there will be some progress in that area? Yeah, I think there's been very little so far. Um, but there is one hopeful thread uh, in the uh, AI community around that, and that's on personal companions for uh, disabled people and older people. Uh, because uh, the Japanese in particular have looked at this because of various uh, demographic problems they have associated with this. And so they're trying to build uh, animated robots and, and AIs that can interact with people in really effective, emotionally effective ways. Um, there are various um, robots that uh, attempt to show emotion by picking up their eyebrows. Uh, uh, there are systems across the world that are attempting to build things that people recognize as uh, having some kind of empathy towards humans. But I think it's, it's so far pretty weak. And the, the most important thing, the biggest barrier, is language. So if we can get systems to really understand natural language, we will be way far down the road uh, from where we are now. Other questions? I, we just have a few minutes. I just wanted to hit one or two more slides. Yeah. So we had a Cambrian explosion about 600 million years ago, 540, depending on how you count. And one possible scenario is we'll see something like that in the 21st century, but we'll get exponential increases in powerful hybrid AIs. There'll be social and economic selection pressure in the web ecosystem. We'll have agents as partners, not only to people, but also to other machines, with people not uh, in that dialogue. Uh, application systems that continuously improve, biologically inspired models. Web agents cooperating and competing selection for entirely new capabilities uh, with huge, um, the awesome capabilities that we'll see after we surpass human intelligence. New capabilities, opportunities, risks, and a variety of new types of intelligence emerging. So obviously there's some a need for thoughtful embedded controls. We're gonna have a workshop about that. Very challenging problem. So I would just encourage you to really take a look and uh, imagine the futures that we could create with this powerful technology. The sky is not the limit on this.
Thank you.